Now let's begin part three of the program. Please welcome back Professor Malcolm Sparrow. Thank you. Good afternoon. So what did we do this morning already? We're sort of flying through different concepts at quite a pace. I'm aware of that. And uh, these one sentence summary descriptions should now mean something to you. So first, focusing on the expert rather than the legal model of regulation. That's the general drift that we have. Um, focusing, um, making sure that you're paying enough attention to the left-hand column, not too blind or trusting or overconfident in the reach of your big, broad, preventive programs, valuable as they are to you. Um, third, uh, the emergence of craftsmanship, the antidote to these two other evils. And fourth, figuring out the balance between program-centric and problem-centric work. Almost everybody trying to at least shift the balance towards a more formalized problem-centric capability and then figuring out how to build that into your organization. Um, I should uh, pause for a while uh, before adding to the list because that's quite a lot to react to and I know there were quite a lot of discussions over lunchtime. I could hear that you were actually talking about work. Which is just delightful uh, that the subject matter is of interest to you. Um, so I am going to pause and say so questions, uh, feedback, objections, and of course, speeches. <laughs> uh, if you want to make your speech, here's a special opportunity. Um, there must be reactions from this morning, things that you want to clarify. Things that you're disagreement, I relish. I don't mind it a bit. Start us off. And, I don't, uh, and if you would like to ask a question and you'd like the camera turned off, that is uh, perfectly possible. We can do that. Um, if it's something that you feel is sensitive and you don't want it recorded forever on video. Yeah. Just in regards to the things you've raised this morning, if you didn't have general measures that would draw causation, yes. you will see that one of the issues of this law is coming up to critical point. Yeah. What's the best way to raise it? Can you organize that? Well, it dep um, what you will hope is that uh, if the problem centered work has been recognized, and the organization has figured out how to manage it, then there's a whole set of systems that should be in place. And one of them is a problem nomination procedure with a centralized collection and funneling point that such nominations go to. And maybe that's a person, or maybe it's a committee that meets from time to time, but you ought to know um, where to send such a thing so that it can be considered and either chosen or not chosen for launch of a formal project. If there is no such system, um, then you're going to have to uh, try and fight your way into, you know, strategic planning or special projects or whatever other system you have that might accommodate work of this type. Um, and often a lot of the work uh, at that point is, um, it's kind of like um, the work of leadership, make, making people feel the pain enough and at the right pace so that there's no avoiding the work that needs to get done. Um, it is often a visible painful crisis um, that gets the problem solving capability in everyone's mind first. Uh, when I draw, I, I can point to things that were here before and you have to remember what they were, right? You have it easy, you only have to do this for a day. My students in a semester-long program had to do it over 12 weeks. So I could say, you know, there was a chart over there three weeks ago. Do you remember what was on it? And they're supposed to remember what was on it. But if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, the problem-centered work, and say, actually, this happens naturally sometimes, just by itself. It doesn't require any recognition or a name um, or any formal managerial apparatus. When do you think it could happen naturally? all by itself. And I think you're, you have one in mind, a visible crisis. Um, the organization behaves quite differently. If you, and the clue is, you know, are you on the evening TV news two days in a row? Once you've got that level of political attention, then failure is not an option. So you will do whatever it takes. The agency will behave quite differently. Normal silos get broken down. 
uh, agencies are forced to collaborate in unusual ways. Um, if it's that level, a politically visible crisis, you don't have a choice but to fix it. And you know all about that at the VBA. Um, that's natural. What's the, there's one other level at which it can happen quite naturally also, even if you don't have a system, even if no one knows what it's called. It's curiously the opposite extreme. It's um, at the very front line, a tiny one person or two person volunteer job. When you've got field engineers out there in the field and they're bright and they're creative and they had enough coffee in the morning and for some reason they feel empowered, they see a problem. They can fix it because that's what engineers love to do. Um, and uh, because it's small scale, and local, uh, and in, in America, the, the joke is this happens more easily the further you are away from Washington. The further you are from headquarters, the more empowered you feel, uh, just to get on with it and do something sensible. Uh, and you can, because it's small scale and it doesn't require any support from the organization. That's the key. So this is a visible crisis that drives massive change. This doesn't require any formal system. It can happen at a low level. It's the kind of creativity that you get. You put an engineer in a disabled person's house and say, follow this person around for two hours and then come up with 10 ideas that will make their life better. They can do that. They love it. That's localized, small scale problem solving. That's all part of um, the mindset of being an engineer. Um, so this is odd. You've got this problem solving capability happens at the visible crisis, it happens at the, right at the very bottom of the organization where you can rely on volunteers acting in their spare time and without any relief, relief from their other duties. Where's the real work, most of the work? It's obviously medium. Why doesn't this happen naturally at medium scale? Well, it's not a crisis yet, which means it remains optional. But it's too big to be handled by volunteers at the local level. It requires funding. It requires a team. It requires managerial supervision. It requires decisions about plans either to be implemented or not. Um, it might require its own analytic support. In other words, we've got to know how to organize a medium thing. It's not going to organize itself. I think all the serious work is medium and you'd like to deal with it before it gets to be a politically visible crisis. And to, in order to do any of this stuff medium, you've got to have the system, the formal system. I do, um, I was asked the question, at lunchtime, you know, do I, why don't I talk about the culture much? Um, I don't, it's true. I'm maybe being a mathematician or being British or whatever, it's just not the normal way I think. Um, I did give, uh, when the previous book, The Regulatory Craft, was published, um, in the year 2000, I gave a talk at the Kennedy School, my lunchtime seminar, and there was a woman there in the corner that I didn't know who she was. Um, but the more I talked, the more visibly agitated she became. And I became quite convinced that when it came question time, she was going to kind of explode. And uh, she did. She jumped up, asked the first question. I know who she is now. She was a PhD student at the law school studying organizational culture. And um, I had described, you know, all the problem solving machinery and protocols and management systems and nomination systems, selection systems, supervision systems, tasking systems, reporting systems, etc. cetera. And her, when she jumped up, she said, I, I came to this talk because I thought that you would be talking about empowerment and uh, letting a thousand flowers bloom and encouraging innovativeness. And all I have heard is about systems, systems, systems. Why on earth are you talking about systems, trying to clamp everything down and lock it in place when we're supposed to be encouraging creativity and innovation? And I said, you know, three years ago, I might have been on your side of this particular debate. But in the intervening three years, I've been in so many agencies 
in so many meetings where the subject is, why isn't it happening? You know, we, we know this stuff. We, we understand the idea. We've already agreed years ago that this should happen. Maybe the secretary or commissioners even announced that this was going to be the way we do our work from now on, and it still doesn't happen. Why isn't it happening year after year after year? And usually the answer is you don't have any system. You don't even know whose right it is to pick a problem. You don't know what makes one important. And you certainly don't know how to get relief from other duties. And if you rely on volunteers on a part-time basis, they will do it once. And then they'll learn to keep their mouths shut. Because every time they open their mouth and nominate a problem, they'll discover more work for me. They'll do that once. But it's not a sustainable long-term thing. You need an HR system that knows how to allocate resources to all of this. So I don't stress culture first. I stress systems, structures, clear understanding, job definition, passing of responsibilities. And yes, you will be innovative. Um, this is not encouraging innovativeness for its own sake. This is uh, knowing how to put people on teams and actually mandate that they find an effective solution, which, by the way, will be innovative because everything you've done before hasn't fixed it. So kind of by definition, it needs to be innovative. Different, uh, different focus. But I am, at the end of the day, British, which makes me sort of non-emotional. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you. Great question. Other qu yeah. Fire away. Um, can, can you hear, or do you need a microphone? Have we got bro roaming mics, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just interested in breaking down, I guess, the difference between, we talk about a risk-based regulator. Yes. And being quite new to the sector, it seems like we're very, well, we are suffering a skill shortage with a lot of the roles that are required within that framework. Yeah. So at what point, or is there talk about risk-based regulation so that a number of entities when an authority, I guess, could move to making sure the system is in place to regulate. So people could specialise, I guess, as you're talking about in your fields, um, with the edge you know, making sure we've got adequate education, making sure that we've got um, adequate uh, compliance tools in place, making sure that we've got um, adequate partnerships and governance in place across the system. Does that make sense? Yes, but I think I heard two questions. Uh, yeah. One, one is about the kind of, what kind of skills go with, and I don't know which version of risk-based you mean. Did you mean the problem-centric capability? Yes, yeah, so the problem-centric, when do we raise it above out of just the agency itself ah. and look at the system resolving then, then you, those problems to make sure looking... we've got the researchers in place, the, the compliance people in place, the, all the tools in place? But we seem to, we're talking in little micro systems. Can you lift it up and look at regulation as a whole of, say, building, I'm talking? Well, and so, so then you, the second issue that you're raising is risks that don't align with one agency and that need to be elevated know, so that you can get interagency collaboration. Yep. And by the way, for the state of Victoria, the strange business of looking across the field of risks and saying which ones don't have a home mm. at all. And I think the VMIA and other uh, in institutions have this role pretty well established inside Victoria, so it's sort of fun to watch you doing this. Um, I w so it's people that break that down, that possibility? So, no, 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 I don't want the microphone, I got my own. Um, <laughs> you can do give, give that. Um, so, above the agency level, there's a couple things you could do in terms of risk. Um, uh, you know, the problem-centered skills. First of all, you could develop skills broadly and appreciate them across the regulatory frontier. So that, that would mean common training programs um, where you're actually trying to get the same basic concepts built across multiple agencies. And um, that's just like you know, training investigators or training auditors. There's no reason why there aren't economies of scale in your training opportunities and in your recruiting, and you could even have rotation 
arranged between regulators so that you can share the benefits of experts in that set of skills. But that's a, that's a particular kind of interagency collaboration that recognizes yet another set of skills that we all should share and develop together. Then the second thing is uh, some risks are bigger than agencies and straddle boundaries and you actually need to work on them together. That's a different kind of collaboration. That's project-based collaboration. And by the way, the second one is much easier if the first one is established, that you, you all know what you're talking about when you say here's a problem-based project and here are the relevant sets of skills. Do you know what the relevant sets of skills are? I'm sure you do if you've worked on these. It's basically the same set of skills that tend to go with a high-performance team environment. So bear in mind that when you put together usually a cross-functional team because the risk doesn't fit anywhere naturally, um, you're talking about people who are self-motivated. They can work uh, hard, far away from their normal supervisor. Um, they play nice with strangers. Um, they tend to be uh, not terribly hierarchy or rank conscious. Um, they are, um, if not uh, producers of data analysis, they're very good consumers of it, know how to read it and take it seriously. They are not wed to one function. They've been around in lots of different ideas, often been in, a, in and out of the public or private sector. Uh, Ex-consultants are really good at this kind of work because they do all of their work in an early consulting role in dedicated high-performance project teams. So they're used to that environment. Um, the people that can uh, talk to outsiders in other agencies and the public without embarrassing your organization. And that's not everybody, um, but it is certainly some. That's the set of skills. I notice this is skills, not knowledge. You can have this set of skills and know nothing about, you know, aluminum cladding or road traffic fatalities or arsenic on golf courses. That's the science. So you need actually to combine the skills with the experts um, in order to be able to figure out a reasonable plan. And some, some organizations I watch uh, make the mistake of starting with experts. They put all the experts together in a team to deal with a, you know, basically a scientific or technical problem. What happens when you put all the experts together in a room? They have the arguments that they always have every time they meet because they're all, they're all experts and they can't learn anything from each other because they're the experts. Well, there's a very important set of skills which you probably want your team leader, team leader to be a generic, skillful person rather than the expert. Uh, you need to know how to bring experts in and debrief them and then send them away and a bunch of others and make something sensible and efficient and legal and politically feasible for you here out of everything that they have to offer. Uh, that's the set of skills. Um, on, uh, do, you, do you remember the question, you know, what's your balance? Uh, how much of this do you want to be of your overall resource effort? Uh, I had one student come on my course at Harvard in 2006 from the Authority for F Financial Markets. Uh, that's, um, it's the equivalent of ASIC, but in the Netherlands. And uh, he went back, he was under very clear instructions from the chairman of the board. He, he said he could go on this course, but only if it changed their agency. <laughs> it's, quite a, it's quite a mandate, isn't it? So on the flight home, he had to figure out, well, how's this going to change my agency? And anyway, they sent more people, and he reported to the chairman of the board, and he kind of liked what he heard. And so they came in a few at a time, and I went there a few times, and it changed their agency. Within five years of the first student showing up, they uh, actually decided, I did not suggest this, they decided to go 100% project-based. I have never advised anyone to do that. I, I warned them, I said, I think that sounds chaotic to me. I don't know whether you'll ever manage to um, handle that. Um, and they uh, did along the way uh, completely scrap their routine audit program of financial services firms. And strangely, nobody complained. <laughs> they still do audits, but only when a project team asks for them, right? 
they got project teams now acting like craftsmen and women. And they say, well, we need three audits, and then we need an education, and we need one case, and then, you know, this is our health protocol. And they organize those things. So they still do plenty of audits, but only when asked for uh, by our problem-centered uh, project team. And anyway, uh, to, switch, to switch from here to here, what do you have to do to the HR function? They, and I didn't teach them any of this. They taught me. Um, they said, oh, uh, we put an enormous amount of investment into interviewing staff. Every new staff member at AFM during this period, they reckon they interviewed them about a dozen times. They got interviewed by their potential boss. They got interviewed by their potential subordinates. They got interviewed by several of their potential peers. Then they got interviewed by the HR people and by organizational psychologists. And they were given data analytic exercises to see how well they might perform with a big spreadsheet, um, you know, with vague questions. Um, all kinds of stuff. And a lot of the people that they recruited had done their two years in a consulting company and then burned out from the travel and were looking to settle down with their families. And that's the perfect recruit for them. Uh, enormous investment in getting the people who could actually handle this environment. It's not everybody, and yes, there is a very specific set of skills. And you've got a lot of them in Victoria. I've met a lot of them uh, in various agencies already, and I know you have them here too. Um, but uh, some people take to it, some people don't, and the ones that don't, you should let them do something else that they're really good at, be it functional process um, or whatever. Other questions? Speak. I haven't heard a speech yet. No? Yes, sir. On any, on any of these four, you should be willing to, you, I, uh, uh, ideally, after a little bit of pause for reflection, you should be able to say, where is my agency on this one? And do we need to move at all? This is more a question of, um organizational methods and I should say that I was instructed last week to come up with a question to ask you that's provocative but not too provocative. You were instructed this way? Uh, uh, <clears throat> that's what I was told to do, yes. So you're just complying now? I'm a compliant... So we're looking for a medium provocative question. So I have a from medium provocative... My, my name's Michael. Michael. So I have a question for you about Freddie Cardoza who was uh, celebrated in one of the readings we were given as uh, he was a, a bad man in Boston and he was given a 19-year jail sentence for possession of a bullet. Mm. Uh, and that jail sentence was uh, apparently very successful in scaring other Boston gang members into not killing each other, at least for a little while. Uh, and was very innovative, and I think the law enforcement agencies in Boston won an award for, for that approach, which was involved more than just jailing Freddie Cardoza. But my question is, uh, do you think it is, do you recommend that we should push back against the principles of proportionality to the extent that we can uh, as a tool that we can add into our regulatory mix to cause a little bit of individual unfairness to people, perhaps like Freddie Cardoza, <laughs> uh, as an innovative way of achieving a regulatory goal. Is that moderate? Did you pass the test? Is it moderately, <laughs> moderately provocative? Uh, it's actually not fair question because only the people that will be with us in the next two days know what, what on earth you're talking about. <laughs> So for the sake of those who don't know what on earth he's talking about, uh, there is a reading for the workshop folks. Uh, in preparation for a discussion on values and discretion um, and, and the governance of them inside a regulatory operation, and this describes the work of the, what's called the ceasefire program in Boston. Um, it was an intervention on juvenile homicide. Serious analysis of the juvenile homicide problem showed that most of it was related to 61 gangs. These 61 gangs were well known to the criminal justice system. Most of the people were on probation or parole when they killed or were killed. Um, and it was a carefully tailored program to reverse peer pressure. And so the peer pressure would act against violence rather than its normal role of promoting violence. 
Um, Freddy Cardoza was not part of that plan. He, his case had preceded the Operation Ceasefire Intervention, but uh, the police and all the agencies that collaborated on this plan wanted to make the case to the gangs that if we come after you, we have so much stuff on all of you that we can put you out of business forever. <laughs> they wanted to deliver the threat and let the threat do the work. And then uh, this was a sort of shared threat. If one me gang member does it, we remove the whole gang. So the purpose of this is to actually orient peer pressure so that now the gang is afraid of them being the focus of attention. They will control violence by any of their members. That's the theory of the plan. And they just used Freddy Cardoza as a poster child to say, oh, by the way, look what we can do to you if we choose. Freddy Cardoza was not a nice fellow. He, he was prosecuted as a career armed felon where you actually have to prove the career even though you can't prove lots of individual cases. Um, and then he was just used as the example of just how serious we can get if we seek federal indictments, accelerated prosecution, and talk to the judge about why the maximum sentence is important. So, but I heard over here earlier this morning that fear is an important tool in your hands. Yes, it is. You should, you should have your Rottweilers, your pit bulls, uh, be able to deliver very, very nasty uh, treatment. Now, your question is about aspects of symbolic enforcement, right? Do you want to make an example of one person for the sake of a big, broader change? Yes, it's a very efficient technique if it's well done. But at the same time, every time an Australian agency rewrites its mission statement and values, you list a whole bunch of values, which normally include justice, proportionality, fairness, equity, consistency, uniformity, transparency, predictability, and even clarity of the rules. And they're all good things. And um, you're, it's like you write them down. Are you now a slave to them? Should you always be consistent? I think consistency is a great idea, except when it isn't. <laughs> I think transparency as a general rule is a good thing, except when it's a very bad idea. You do undercover operations, is that transparent? You set traps for people, is that transparent? You do unannounced on-site inspections, is that transparent? No. You do focusing and targeting, that's not consistent. So there's lots of ways in which you take bites out of these values, even though you write the list of them. You believe in them in general for very good reasons. And um, it, you actually, it, the world is way more complex than saying you will always adhere to one or another of these. They even compete with each other on occasions, and that's the territory we'll explore together as a group on uh, whenever it is. Tuesday afternoon. Other questions? But I can report, if you would like me to report, that you have been compliant <laughs> uh, with whoever it was that asked you to do this. Uh, uh, Ma'am, uh, you had your hand up first. Yep. Well, I can, but <laughs> but, um, not my priority. Yeah. Yeah. And we do the education, we do the inspections, we do the information, and the same three or four problems keep coming up where potentially you could use that method set outside of our list of values mm -hmm. and to change the behaviour as well as a different process. Yeah. That. Yeah, no, the, the symbolic enforcement, if it's well conceived, um, is a very effective way of getting a message out. It needs to be a carefully selected target that does the social work that you want it to do. Um, you know, bear in mind if you go overboard on somebody um, for the sake of just making an example of them and then they ha happen to 
you know, suffer anxiety or commit suicide, then, which has happened uh, as a result of symbolic enforcement actions, then it's devastating for them and for you. So you need to be very carefully and judiciously selected targets for whom the public or the industry will have little sympathy. Um, and by the way, you can even um, compensate them for the extra pain if you feel like it. Or if you're really squeamish, use an actor instead. <laughs> but then you've got to worry about whether you're being transparent and honest. <laughs> Uh, but yes, uh, symbolic enforcement uh, has its place in the toolkit. Uh, there are national differences in regulatory culture as to how acceptable is it. And Australia, I think, is right in the middle of the spectrum, as far as I can tell. Which means you do it, you contemplate it, you're not quite as hungry for it as Americans, um, but you do it uh, on a fairly regular basis. Um, sir, you had a question? If you miss, yes. if you try and make a big public profile out of a case that doesn't go, doesn't smell right, then you do yourself in inordinate damage. You are broadly advertising your inaccurate targeting. That's not a useful thing to do. So make sure it's very carefully selected if you're going to publicize it. You have a question too, or you've got a niche? Which, yeah, question really about um, expert versus legal model. Uh, yes. My bias is obviously to the legal model as a lawyer. Um, Are you the, were you a lawyer that voted legal? Or did you vote expert? I, I voted legal. Yeah. Um, is, it not, is it not important? Are you fe feeling better now? Have you sure. got over it? <laughs> That's right. Have we changed your mind? No, I haven't changed my mind. OK. Is, is it? I, I, I sort of changed my mind. So. <laughs> When you realise you're in the mi minority. Yeah. Um, but don't you need to be um, a competent legal uh, regulator? So be able to enforce all of the small things and have confidence of the people who you are regulating before um, you, be, you sort of focus on the other model, the expert, expert regulation stuff. model. Because to use yes. your, your sort of sporting analogy, do you not have to have confidence and faith that the referee is going to use the rules and the law you know competently and consistently before they make calls like oh actually in this circumstance you can play on do you notice that how the sporting language pops out immediately i i have figured this out already in australia compliance is just another sport <laughs> it's just that one of the teams is the government and the public's looking around for the referee to call you out for having cheated, for broken the rules. So, uh, so I, uh, here's the original chart, right? You remember it. Um, I think you're exactly right in the cautions that you raise. Uh, first of all, if you go so far over to the expert side um, that it looks as if it's obvious to everybody that there's rules on the books that you're never bothering to enforce. Um, this eventually will discredit the entire regulatory regime. So you do have an obligation, as you, if you drift this way, I believe to, I call it cleaning up your tail. Don't leave stuff on the books that's obviously out of date or doesn't count on, be deliberate and get rid of it. If you have a, you know, the, the next deregulatory wave washes through politically, um, seize the opportunity to clean out your cupboard and throw away old rules. That's exactly what they're asking you to do. You're not throwing out important ones. You're throwing out the ones you weren't bothering much to enforce anyway because they didn't count anymore. Uh, but I do believe you should clean up your tail, otherwise you discredit the whole operation. And then the second piece of caution is as you tread over here into the um, expert space, uh, remember, what was the question that I asked you? What's the right thing for a public official to do in a democracy? So what you notice is if you're in the left-hand circle, you've been through your rulemaking procedures, which all have mandatory consulting, um, or your equivalent of a public notice and comment period. 
you're obliged to consult with everybody. That's the formal democratic process before you get the rule. Well, if you're going to go over here, are you circumnavigating the democratic process? There's a danger that you are. So how do you operate over here if you're going to operate over here, which most of you want to do? Answer, not quietly, not covertly. If you're going to operate over here, you do it with deliberate fanfare. You tell everybody, you stand up and announce, look what I see, I've got a pile of dead bodies here, or banks in danger, or whatever it is. Um, I'm looking around, I don't see anyone paying attention to this. We have some ideas about what to do. Please, if you interpret the data differently, speak up. If you think this is covered by somebody else, speak up. If you've got a better idea than ours, speak up now, sooner rather than later. But if I don't hear any objection, this is what I plan to do. I'm really open about it. So don't come you know, back six months from now and take me to court. Take me to court now, if you want to. What are you doing? You are operating in a way that produces an operational version of democracy. It's not the formal rulemaking version, but you are being so deliberately open about all of your intentions and uh, actively inviting people to disagree. And if you do all of that well, this is an operational version of democracy and you are substantially lowering the chances that they'll challenge you legally later. And you know, your lawyers can stand up and defend why actually you're authorizing statutes give you this broader right. And in fact, this is what the public expects. And if we didn't do this, look what trouble we'd all be in. Um, so you need the enabling lawyers here, not the cautious lawyers. I'm sure you're an enabling lawyer, <laughs> despite your vote. Um, he will be by this evening, yep. Yes, sir. Um, but that's part of the deal. You get to talk to everybody and renegotiate. Um, so your political management um, responsibilities are to make sure that the external environment is lined up around what you think is valuable and the methods that you're going to use. This is uh, Mark Moore, my colleague at the Kennedy School, his basic strategic public management model. Whatever you're going to do as a public official, You've got to have a clear sense of what is the public value. You've got to have a clear sense of the methods that you will use. And you've got to have a clear sense of where your political support is coming from. And it's your obligation to make sure that those three things are all lined up together. So sometimes you do run into public servants and say, look, I've got a really valuable idea, but no one else sees it that way. Well, that's a problem for you to figure out. Um, adjust your sense of value or adjust their sense of value. Um, but you've got to get them aligned. Uh, whatever you're going to do and accomplish in the public sector, it's got to be valuable, doable, and supportable. And I often end up asking, on, where we have some case discussions that sort of bring out the balance between our attention to these three ideas. We are all trained in management schools. We're really good on the doable, 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 all the technical methods that we can use to accomplish this, that, or the other. If I ask public servants, who here regards themselves as a skilled political manager, then there's not that many people put up their hands. We need more attention to managing the political environment to make sure that we are agreed what's valuable and aligning. And it's, it's not going to happen as an act of God. It's work to be done uh, to get these things aligned. That doesn't make it easy. <laughs> it just says that that's the work to be done. And uh, an organization like yours, very complex, you need the collection of skillful political managers um, that can make sure you've got the support and understanding from outside to enable you to do the work that you think is valuable. Um, make sense? So, Uh, business as normal. 
we got state, local, and federal. Um, and then if you go to Europe, they've got state, local, and national, and then Europe on top trying to figure out what is their role from Brussels. So normally there's you know three, four layers of regulators, um, and you're hoping for common sense allocation of responsibilities across a patchwork. Now, of course, you know, if it gets really messy, you can just bump it all up to the Commonwealth level. And then eventually they'll discover, well, that's not locally responsive enough, and they'll bump it back down again. Uh, that's a sort of natural cycle also. Um, where uh, there are inconsistencies in rules and gaping holes in jurisdictions, there's an obligation to clean the rigid system up. It's a shared responsibility. Sometimes, um, even when it's clean and perfect and all neat and tidy, you've still got risks that don't align where you're going to have to collaborate anyway. It's easier to collaborate if at least you've got consistency. Um, sometimes you're having to collaborate across a messy patchwork. Um, but actually, that's why I think uh, your lives are important. Um, because you can have a pretty lousy set of laws and uh, inconsistencies built in and fuzzy overlapping jurisdictions and sensible regulators by choosing what to focus on and what's important and what's not and where they have a law to use it, where they don't have a law to think of 10 other things they can do instead and collaborating when they need to, they can end up providing very effective protection even with a lousy set of laws. So your structuring of your discretion across this complex mess is, can be incredibly constructive. And you can do it. Any more? Or do you want more stuff? Have, is there room in your brain for any more stuff? I, I'm going to raise two other issues. Um, we got that far. Uh, I'm going to, uh, there, I'll tell you what the other three are, and then we're going to cover five and six. Uh, this afternoon, then we'll be done. First is a um, complex idea. It's uh, not about the tools that you want to master. Tools, I'm, that's about um, you know, enforcement or education or outreach programs or partnership or voluntary guidelines, all of these kinds of things. Structures is different from tools. Structures is about uh, which parts of the risk management task will you delegate to industry and under what conditions. And that is linked to the discussion of all these hyphenated forms of regulation. There's so many of them these days. Prescriptive regulation, self-regulation, light touch trusting re regulation. What have you got? Responsive regulation, co-regulation, really responsive regulation. And I did read an article about really, really responsive regulation. At that point, I stopped reading. <laughs> I thought these are not useful English words. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about that one, and uh, we're going to talk about um, what happens uh, if you actually use your risk focus as the foundation for your partnership with the industry that you govern, um, and why that's different from some other ideas. The seventh, I'll just tell you what it is, but we're not going to cover it today because there's no time, is to start talking about wicked classes of problems. Folks in the workshop will spend a period on that. Even that period is short. Um, this is really an advert. The whole of the second half of the character of harms is about s wicked problems of one kind or another. Um, why? Because when you start organizing around risks, and only when you start organizing around risks, you soon discover some of them are just bears to control. They behave in strange and unusual ways, not like well-behaved risks. Um, and so, therefore, the study of them becomes a, a sort of part of the basic uh, knowledge that a risk controller would want to have. Let's take a look at number five. Um, so if I'm running an occupational safety and health agency, um, and I'm the chairman, and I stand up on Monday and say, uh, our mission is to guarantee a safe workplace for all Australians. And then my deputy stands up on Tuesday and says something subtly different. On Tuesday, the deputy says, our mission 
is to require businesses to provide a safe workplace for all Australians. Have I changed anything? I've shifted responsibility in a curious fashion. Now when the chemical plant blows up and kills 10 people, we both failed, but we failed in rather different ways. Um, probably different than if I said, you know, I guarantee a safe workplace for all Australians. That's the recipe for failure, because uh, that's not going to happen. Um, but uh, when and under what conditions would you delegate parts of the task? That's uh, this one. So I'm going to show you a... What, we're going to spend a while on this particular PowerPoint slide. I'd like you to know this is as good as I get in PowerPoint. <laughs> so the second best that I had was the two-by-two two chart with all the moving bits, but I created that in 1998. Uh, this one... This one I only created in like 2010. Um, but, and it does a challenging job. Um, it tries to connect this idea that you're basically in the harm reduction business, which can crudely be divided into three phases. For any risk to be controlled, somebody's got to discover it first, be able to see it and understand it. Second, there's the epidemiological work, stage one and two. Um, figure out the way it is, the way it works, and then figure out a suitable sabotage plan uh, or intervention. And then, of course, as a result of the plan, somebody has to act or stop acting in a particular way. That's ordinary. Now, we can get a lot of purchase uh, by placing those jobs in government or with industry. And there's lots of permutations and combinations who gets which one. And I'm going to try and connect that with your use of ordinary labels for structures and figure out, well, what is prescriptive regulation and what is responsive regulation? Let's just see how the labels fit. I don't really mind what labels you use. That varies by country, sometimes by agency. But I want you to understand the structure. If you understand the structure, you can see when it's safe and when it's not by what you're trusting that the different parties can actually do or are inclined to do. So here we go, very simple stuff. Um, we got government, let's just keep it one layer of regulators to keep it simple, and we got us and them. Um, <coughs> the American tradition is highly uh, prescriptive. Um, I assume the long-term history in Australia is also quite prescriptive. Uh, at this point, I normally use an example from the building industry, but you make me nervous <laughs> on that front. Um, government says there's a problem, children falling off balconies. Happens in high-rise apartment complexes and a lot more in hotels that don't like big railings because they're supposed to look pretty. And so in, re in, a com in recognizing this risk, that we're going to make rules about railings, right? Anybody know what the rules about railings are in, in, in Victoria? You do? Somebody can rattle them off? Like one meter, one meter, that's all? I thought it was 48 inches, but okay, we'll go for a meter. <laughs> Got to be made of? No horizontal bars, so you can't climb up them. Well, yeah. Ba -ba 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 -ba. And then the red, and they got to be made of what? Quarter inch steel? No, you, you've got the, oh, the force, the resistance, and then you've got to be cemented into the sidewalls and spans no more than eight feet. Oh, you do meters. You know. you, all your children are measured in meters. Yeah. <laughs> so a baby's head can't slip through. That means four inches. What's that in meters? 125 millimeters. Yeah, so you've got all of those rules. Very good. Uh, slightly different. Um, so uh, we will spot the risk. We'll figure out what must be done. We make up a set of rules, and then you, industry, have to build them that way, right? That's the starting position. Now, so now when we come around and inspect a building site to see if you built your railings correctly, have you done this? You've inspected railings. What do you take with you? A tape measure and a copy of the rules if you can't remember them all. And then you can determine compliance or not. Tick or cross? Cool. <laughs> What's it called? That's a regulatory structure. What do you call that? That's a method. 
It's a relationship. What's it called? You have names for it. Rule-based, prescriptive. <clears throat> what else might you call it? Have any other labels for it? Do you have unfriendly labels for it? Like this is a stupid idea, old hat. In America they do. It's called rule-based or prescriptive. Those are the neutral terms. If you don't like it, you call it command and control, which to a civilian regulator is supposed to um, imply rigid and silly like the military. Sorry, military people. I mean, actually, command and control is absolutely right for many tasks, um, but it means, you know, too inflexible. And if you really don't believe in it at all, you call it one size fits all, because that's sarcasm. The message there is how could you ever be so foolish as to imagine that one size fits, you know, multinational corporations and a mom and pop grocery store and that you got the same rules about having separate men's and women's toilets and stupid stuff like that. It does all the your governing planes, and some of them are jets, and some of them are propellers, and some fly long haul, some fly only over the land. You know, how could you ever have one set of rules to govern the whole industry? Stupidity, that's the message here. Why might you ever move away from a prescriptive regime? Genuine reasons for moving beyond a prescriptive regime and changing what is delegated. Yes, sir, in the corner. Huh? To form a solution? A performance solution. What's a performance solution? I can't hear you because you're lying down. Sit up. <laughs> Sit up. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I got it. So if you can be clear about the goal and you're prepared to give them a lot of flexibility on the method, uh, then it might be better. So uh, Builder comes to you, Mr. Railings Man, what's your real <laughs> name? Daniel. David. David. And says, hey, we've got a better idea. We want to build our railings out of plexiglass. Hmm. Uh, we want to put a slippery scrum, chrome strip along the top. That's much, much safer, they say. Because, you know, your bars, they look like a climbing frame to a kid. And they can't climb up this, and they're not in, in, inclined to try. But we can't do this better thing because you've got no rules about plexiglass. Do you have rules about plexiglass? Hmm. Okay, so I'm not feeling so bad now about my, <laughs> my building example. But they say we can't do this safer thing because you're still talking about bars. Um, so please loosen up, give us more freedom. That's one reason. So to accommodate technical innovation quicker, uh, you might want to have um, not rely on the same kind of regime. Another reason for moving beyond um, Model 1. What about when I got huge propeller, uh, jet engines and I've got small propeller planes and mom and pop stores and multinational corporations, if you've got genuine diversity in the industry, then the idea of having one set of rules that really does cover all of this vast array looks increasingly less likely uh, to be feasible. So that's the second major reason. Accommodate technical innovation quicker, um, recognize diversity in the industry, and there's a half a reason as well to make two and a half reasons. The half a reason is we're a bit fed up with people technically complying with the letter of the law, but managing to trample the spirit of it. So we'd actually rather get, get back to a clear statement of the spirit of the law. You must provide adequate protection against moisture penetration or whatever it is in your building. But we don't mind how you do that, right? What job should we move? Which part of the risk management task are we going to move and in what direction to take care of those things? Which of these jobs do you want to move and in which direction? Give them analysis and design? Delegate that. Watch carefully. This is what makes me so proud of this slide. 
Did you like that? Would you like to see that again? That took me hours to figure out how to get that working. Good, thank you for appreciating it. So we give them that one too. Now what's this called? We'll, we'll, we still specify what the risk is, notice. We don't want the kids falling off the balconies. We don't want moisture penetration to your buildings. And we don't want them falling down in an earthquake. But we'll let you figure out the technology. Yeah? What's that called? <laughs> the National Construction Code. <laughs> really? This is a new performance-based construction code, yes? Aspects of it. Yeah, it's normally called uh, uh, performance-based is a clear label. Outcome-based is a pretty clear label. The British, for some reason, like to call this principle-based. I don't know if that leaks over into Australia. It's not really principles in my view, but they like principles. Um, and Australians sometimes call this one responsive regulation, but you call so many different things responsive regulation now. I think it's kind of lost its particular meaning. Yeah, yeah. But even that has to be regulated. So you come up with a new idea. Yeah. When would you uh, prove it works? Before they use it or after they've used it? Ah, then that's the more cautious version of performance-based. Like we have approved plans, you can use them without our permission. We have anything else that you care to propose is okay with us, but you must submit it to us in advance. And then we will have our experts who will make a determination, will this work? Or test it in the lab if necessary. That's the cautious version. What's the, the least cautious version? Just do anything you like, and we'll hold you accountable according to whether it works or not. If it works, fine. You can build your railings of plexiglass and chrome as long as it works. Okay? So now, under this model, you come around to do a railings inspection. What will you bring? You're still going to bring a tape measure, but you've got no rules. You're going to bring a child. <laughs> Not just, not just one child. You're going to bring a whole army of children, all sugared up. You, you're going to give them half a pint of ice cream each, and then let them loose with this railing, preferably with a mattress the other side of it, so it's safe. Does it work? If it works, OK with us, right? That's the notion here. All right. So we've gone a, a little bit further in delegation, therefore, and for reasons that we can understand. So all good reasons. Um, now, having gone this far, do you think that you, any industries would come to you and say, hold on a minute, government, you're a bit arrogant, aren't you? What makes you think that you know the risks in our business better than we know them? What kinds of industry will say that to you? Yep. Um, so, yeah, if you're, if you're running a regime that's inherently dangerous and they, they chose, choose to ensure those things, of course, then they're going to want effective control. I gather you have some interesting issues with insurance companies choosing not to govern risks um, and uh, trying to figure out the incentives that that produces. Um, what kind of industries will say, come on, government, wake up. We know, we know our risks better than you ever could. N new ones. What, what type of new ones? High-tech, uh, complex engineering settings, advanced sciences, where they are inventing new technologies, and they have the experts that invented them. So nuclear power plant engineering, civil aviation is in this category. Um, nanotechnology, bioengineering, uh, even autonomous vehicles. Um, they say, why don't you give us that one too? Watch carefully. <laughs> Do you like the way these other guys shuffle over to make room? <laughs> Look. Oh, no mid-air collisions. That took me another hour. <laughs> Let's let them do everything, shall we? 
give them that one too. Oh, it doesn't look like we need regulators anymore, does it? Nothing for them to do. What are we asking regulated industry to do now? Self-regulate. What does that mean? Does that mean to make sure that we comply with the rules? No, that's model one. You could have a self-inspection regime under model one, but that's still rule-based. What are you asking them to do here? Create Not create the rules. Run a risk management program fit for purpose from beginning to end. You can spot the risks. You can figure out what should be done. You can do it. Do we need regulators anymore? This looks awfully cheap. If you're in a European austerity country uh, who has had to take a severe slashes to their public budget, and in Britain's case, 20% twice within a period of five years, this looks very attractive. L let's get them regulating themselves. Do you need regulators, though? What for? What do they do? They have to make sure that this is real, that it's actually effect, uh, operated effectively. So yes, you do need regulators. It's called self-regulation, of course. Um, but the regulator needs to approve the risk management plan as fit for purpose and audit it from time to time to make sure it's not a pretense. It's not a charade. It's actually working. So we expect them not only to do this competently, we expect them to report to us honestly. Now what kind of a regulator do you need for this to work, to be trustworthy? Telling me, I mean, you need a regulator that could go to maybe a, a powerful corporation who's politically well connected and tell them that their risk management plan is not fit for purpose and make it stick. That is an incredibly experienced, knowledgeable and confident regulator and fearless. How many of them do you have? Lots, hopefully. But that's a different kind of a regulator than the one who ticks the boxes on a compliance chart with a tape measure, forgive me, which job that could be delegated to a high school kid for the most part. Oops. <laughs> for, for an area where the rules were so precise. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is the self-regulatory model. Now you're all clever people. Um, you can see that there's space for a fourth one. Is it my imagination or the lights keep going up and down? They do, or is it just as I move back and forth? Yes. I think there's switches under the carpet. Um, so uh, why do we need a fourth one? Well, even when you're in a high-tech complex or engineering setting, you often have a lot of SMEs, to use that phrase, small or medium enterprise, tiny little companies doing highly specialized things, some of them with <laughs> profound implications. Imagine, there's a company of four software engineers writing the flight control system for a Max 8. There's a, that's all they do, they write software. Now, uh, do they want to have a risk officer and report quarterly? No, that's very inefficient from their point of view. What would they rather in that kind of a setting? Or they're writing the control modules for a nuclear power plant. It's highly specialized work. What do they want in terms of regulation? They will ask for one of two things. Either please give us simple rules. We'd like, we'd be happy to comply. We don't want this. That's too complex and inefficient for us. Or if they don't want the government involved, what will they do instead? they'll band together and form an industry association and have them do it instead. So they will delegate the business of risk management to an industry association, which is a creature of industry. It's created by them for economies of scale and it's a little effective as a buffer against government. The more credible the industry association becomes in identifying and controlling risk and promulgating the voluntary guidelines, the more government might trust them to do it and back off. There's, of course, there's lots of other reasons for an industry association appearing, like exchange of technical data, um, 
uh, lobby power and all of that, but this is a genuinely good reason for them to appear, to share the task of risk management. Now, now industries prefer their indus industry association to the regulator. Why? Because they have no enforcement power. All they can do is promulgate best practice guidelines and voluntary stuff. And if the industry doesn't like those things, they can fire them because they pay for them, they made them. Is the delegation here of authority is upwards, not downwards. Um, so that's model four. So there you go, I hope you like my chart. I'm, it's not quite finished yet. Um, now it's time to apply and translate. So which models do you operate? One, two, three, four, or more than one of them? Which ones do you have coming down the pike? Is that an Australian phrase? Coming along. I see discussion happening. I see diagnosis. We operate mainly in one and two. One and two. So you've got more than one operating. You've got areas which are governed by prescriptive regulation. And you've got some performance-based standards. Yep. Can, you, can you recite for me very briefly a performance-based standard? You must have adequate protection against fire. fire. <laughs> 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 really? Is it that short? <laughs> it's a bit more detailed than that. But it's not like you've got to have all the following long list of technology and here are the approved parts. It's a bit more versatile than that. Okay, and what do you do uh, govern with absolute type prescriptive rules? No deviance is allowed, no deviation is allowed. Well, that, that example is classic, the, ba the balustrade. The balustrade height, the meter, meter. that's it, it hasn't changed. No, sure, but you can go way beyond that if you want. Um, Okay, so you operate this and this. Now here you begin to notice that in order to squeeze this all on one slide, I had to make a lot of simplifying assumptions, huge simplifications. I'll just tell you the three most obvious ones. First of all, I have put all of these, you're taking pictures of my slide. I, I am flattered. <laughs> but you will be getting copies of it later, so don't, yeah, by all means, go ahead. Um, where was I? Yes, thank you. So one of the simplifications is all these bubbles are up or down, binary. Any of them could be shared halfway. We meet with them to do risk identification. We share our insights and data and analysis. We do that job together. Or having identified a risk, we meet with them to discuss what is the best kind of balcony for the next 10 years, given the available technologies. Or having decided, you know, done your epidemiological analysis, we then meet with them to figure out which of us will act or how we will share the action, both preventive and contingency planning and responsive uh, for when something goes awfully wrong. Okay? So we can share any of these. If you, if you shared any of them, what would you call it? Another hyphenated form of regulation. You'd probably call it co-regulation. Just notice how many versions of co-regulation there are then. If you share at least one of these and there's three and you could share any of them, then that means there's seven different versions of co-regulation available, depending on which things you share. Huge uh, variety. Second simplification. I've only shown you one layer of regulators. You already told me you've got a horrible patchwork, right? Overlapping things within the state, then the Commonwealth playing some role, might be international <coughs> collaborations or mutual recognition agreements or all kinds of other things interfering as well. Um, so I've only shown one layer of regulators. I think sometimes it's two or three, or in Europe, four. The more complex the regulatory structure, the more useful this kind of analysis becomes. Let's figure out who is best placed to carry out which parts of the risk management job. That is an important piece of analysis. It should lead us to a clear understanding of the right structure for this class of risks or for that class of risks. Third simplification. 
any of these jobs can be contracted out to a private market. Third party auditors that you can buy, like we trust accountants to do part of the public job there. Um, you can buy research and risk identification from academics or from consulting companies. Um, you can probably buy this kind of work also from outsiders and you can even prepare to buy action when it's warranted. Um, if you do use private markets for any part of the regulatory task, which of course is normal these days, um, just be prepared to think very carefully through their incentives. What is it that they have to do to get repeat business? We learned this from certain aspects of the global financial meltdown, um, the role of uh, risk, uh, credit risk rating agencies. There's only 11 of them in America, but um, they were getting repeat business by giving inflated ratings, and that, that did enormous damage. Um, and we had to rethink the whole incentive structure. So think through that a bit carefully if you do use third party contractors. So uh, all of that's there in the background too. I don't know, um, I don't make new charts all that often and I usually make them like this with moving parts only when I've done something on the blackboard or whiteboard about 20 times. So now I know how it's gonna go and my arm is getting very tired and it's time to automate it. Well for me, um, this, this on the whiteboard was done mostly in Europe because of the European better regulation movement, which has been rumbling now for almost two decades. It sort of went quiet during the global financial crisis because they said it's better for us to keep quiet for a while. They have a clear preference, which is expressed in many of the European documents. By the way, there are echoes of it in the OECD better regulation philosophy, which has, affects you. Um, and you can read the Hampton Report and the McCrory Principles and all of these other documents that um, are their background. And you can hear this statement very frequently. We prefer a light touch, trusting, self-regulatory model. In other words, Model 3 is the default. That seems to be the European story at least from outsiders who want to influence regulators. Notice that the better regulation movement never comes from regulators. It upsets regulators because it's such a lousy title. Better regulation, like outsiders have got a better idea than you. Um, that sort of just provokes resentment and defensiveness uh, off the bat. It's mostly driven by the pro-economic development side, the pro-business lobby. It is they who label things better regulation as a general rule. It doesn't mean that regulators shouldn't want better regulation, they just don't start with that title. Um, so that's what uh, the default is in, in uh, Europe, um, at least in theory and um, in response to a preference for light touch trusting self-regulatory models, I would say, well, when is that safe? Under what conditions is the Model 3 safe? And I'm not asking for you, you know, to do anything other than logical examination of what we're expecting from the structure. Model 3 would work fine if we're expecting them to do this, we're expecting them to do that, we're expecting them to do this, and then, by the way, tell us, honestly, under what conditions would that work well? So here's the European question. Model 3 would work fine for risks that, finish the sentence, please. Unknown? Are low. In other words, nothing important. You wouldn't trust the European model on anything important. You don't trust Europeans in general. I'm a European. Trust. Okay, okay. So, but, uh, okay, so the, note that's a very interesting um, starting claim. Wouldn't trust Model 3 on anything important. What would you trust on anything important? Which model? You want to be confident that they had the ability. Ah, oh, but that's a different question than is it important. 
could it be important and you have confidence that they can deliver it? Is that plausible? Yes. It is. So well, that's certainly clear from the structure. We want them to be able. What else do we want? Huh? Or oh, why? How does a strong consumer focus on the industry help you? I'm thinking of dairy food safety. So it is important hmm. for a self-regulated industry to be uh, providing safe product into the marketplace. So there'd be a consumer, strong consumer focus. What does that do for you in terms of their motivation? Well, they become part regulated. Yeah, they have their own risk management little function, and one of their big risks is reputational damage. And if you've got a very strong consumer focus, what that does for you is it lines up the private incentives with the public. Good. Thank heavens for consumers if they're well informed and uh, powerful and have enough choice, you know, if the market does. If, uh, so, yes, so consumer, strong, active consumers, what that does is helps align the incentives of industry with the public incentives, which could otherwise be quite at odds. Could be. So that's the second criteria. We'd like them to have a business interest in the public good. That would be helpful. So they were motivated. What else? Yeah. Um, they'd have to have the capability to do it. To do it or to, to do what? To actually be able to identify the risk. And to identify the risk in the first place. It would have to be something that they can see at their level with data that they have analysis that they know how to do and are inclined to do, right? Do you, so are there risks, do you imagine, that can't be seen at the level of one company, but which could be seen if you put all the data together and look from a higher level? Are there any, well, can you think of any in your business? I mean, issues to do with certain building materials that go horribly wrong, you know, one builder might have only seen it once or never, but you've seen it 200 times. You, with aggregate data and a higher level view, can see all kinds of things they can't see at their level. Can an airline see an air congestion problem? No, because all the other planes aren't theirs. You need the higher level view. It's a national function. Um, so, yep, that's true too. It's got to be something that they can see, something that they um, are interested in controlling, something that they can control. And the other thing, of course, that they'd tell you about. Some risks, uh, they'd sweep under the carpet and they'd fester and you'd never hear about them because you, know, you can predict that they'd never tell you. What, what if the risk is corruption on the board? <coughs> Do you think the risk officer is going to step forward and say, I need to have a conversation with the regulator here, we've got corrupt board members? Or fraudulent manipulation of the share price? to all of our advantage. No, they're not going to step forward and talk to you about those things. They're going to fill your time with little stuff that doesn't bother them, because they like to do that sometimes. So it's got to pass all four tests, things that they can see, things that they're happy to disclose to you, not embarrassed by, things they have a business interest in controlling. The consumers will help with that. Um, and four things that are within their capacity. OK, I'm happy now. Europe, if the risks pass all four tests, I'm happy go with Model 3. What do you think about that class of risks, the subset of risks that pass all four tests? Are these, are these uh, is that a big subset, do you think, or a tiny subset? Of the risks, that, well, the risks that matter, the ones that are likely to be the next scandal. I mean, these are the ones that, if they had any sense, they'd be doing all this stuff anyway. Why, why do they need a regulator if it's a sensible corporation? They can see a risk, they, they're not embarrassed by it, they want to control it, and they can. Would they not do this anyway? And if, they, if there's a regulatory role with respect to those, what is it? Well, to encourage them a bit and uh, organize nice conferences and symposia so that they can share the latest, best technical understanding and scientific research. But on these, you won't have an ugly relationship. They, they're on your side, and they're not embarrassed by it. I don't think, hold on one second, I don't think that's where the next big scandal is coming from. 
the next big scandal that gets you on the front page is more likely to be one that they couldn't see at their level and we had stopped watching. So no one saw it coming. And then it's a big, nasty surprise. That's called now a failure of vigilance. We've got the language for it. Or we assume that they'd tell us, but they didn't. They swept it under the rug, and it festered for 10 years before anyone found out about it. And so now when it's finally revealed, it's the most unholy stink, and heads roll everywhere, government and industry. What's your latest example? Uh, live baiting in the greyhound industry. New South Wales. How long had that been going on before the scandal erupted? It had been hidden for years and years and years. Um, or third, we assumed they had an interest in controlling this problem, but in fact it was a genuine externality. That's economic language. The harm is suffered by others and remotely, not by the person who caused it, um, and therefore they become more profitable the more of this they can get away with dumping toxic waste in the river rather than paying the very heavy proper disposal fees, cheating ban uh, bank customers, on, dead ones, on fees for no service, um, cheating uh, customers on hidden fees and improper interest rate uh, calculations. So the more of that you can get away with, the more profitable you become. Your interests are not aligned with the public or things that we assume that they could control it, but in fact, when the bad day comes, they can't. Like, think the Japanese nuclear power plant station, and not only does the tsunami wash over, which they had figured, but it knocked out their power supply, which they hadn't. Um, and so all of a sudden, they need an enormous amount of external help to cope with the situation. So, Okay, if it passes all four, then uh, by all means stick with model three, but if it doesn't pass some of these, we might have to go back. What if it's one that they can't see at their level with data available to them and analysis they know how to do? Then what? Where do you have to go back to? Well, you've got to go back to where government is uh, capable of watching this thing and spotting it in the first place. So these little red arrows appear. If not, then you've got to go back at least to Model 2 or Model 1, but Model 2 would do. What about genuine externalities when they have no interest in controlling the problem? Then what? Better go back to Model 1 and you tell them the rules and don't expect a pleasant relationship. There's no question, this is a compliance operation. We know this isn't in your private economic interests and it's required. And the same is true, uh, you might have to intervene on things they can't control, you might have to be ready to take a more active part either in prevention or in planning or in response, any of these. That leaves one third uh, last possibility. What if you trust them on a whole bunch of things because the interests and capabilities are aligned, but you can imagine some risks that you know full well they would never tell you about? Then what? It, under a self-regulatory regime. Then you have an extra obligation as a regulator, which is to be able to discover it for yourself. Don't wait for them to tell you the things you know they'd never tell you. That means you need a detection and verification apparatus which goes around their risk management plan so that people can tell you things directly uh, where they don't have the right to funnel all of the complaints um, or internal reports um, and where you don't trust their reports for comprehensiveness or accuracy. You audit them, um, particularly looking for the things that you could predict uh, are areas for concealment. There, that's my chart. Do you like it? Okay, what's, so what's the point? Uh, I know you can't change your regulatory structure, right? That would require a change in the law. So is it useless to understand what your structures are good for and what they're not good for. I don't think it's useless. I think there's ways that you can use the analysis even without changing your regulatory structure. 
Um, the first thing I would recommend is that you understand um, how you got to where you are if, in fact, you're using multiple models simultaneously. And you want to think why that is, and is it a reliable basis? Um, so in my classroom in Harvard, when we have, like um, we had uh, two weeks ago, 31 separate regulatory agencies represented in a room, now I ask the question, so how many of you are operating which models? Nearly everyone says more than one. And the follow-up question is, well, why? And what they tell me is a story about historical fashions, periods, when they got responsibilities, and so that's how we regulate. So we had this bit of the industry originally, and by then, you know, in 1980, everything was prescriptive, so it's always been prescriptive. And then we got this extra piece of the industry, or maybe we got the plumbing industry added in um, for whatever reason. And um, that happened in whatever year it was, 1997, and by then they're talking about performance-based. So that piece, we regulate that way. And then in 2009, we got our latest and best edition, whole new jurisdiction or a piece of a different industry. And by then, everyone is talking about light touch, trusting, self-regulation as, as if that's the default model. So that piece, we regulate that way. Now I'm terrified. If the way that you allocate your structures is according to political history and fashion, we've got to do better than that. We've got to figure out which model is safe and for what types of risk. And if you've got them wrong, the reason it's still useful to be able to do that analysis is because even without changing your structure, you can figure out which risks are dangerous. And you can do a little extra around the edges to shore up your performance, to make sure they don't bite you. You know, if you're mostly doing this, but there's some they can't see, then you'd better create that capability. If there's some things you know they couldn't control, you'd better be ready to offer them help in the preventive planning or response space, et cetera, et cetera. You can do a little extra around the edge to round out your performance. You don't have to throw away your law, the whole legal structure. It's probably good for some things, right? So um, in terms of uh, the way the um, regulatory field progresses, um, you might imagine if you read the academic literature and certainly if you read the, watch the political winds of change, you might imagine that we're all moving to the right. And that that's progression over decades, the last 30 decades in particular, the last three decades in particular. And uh, we rehearse all the time the reasons for moving to the right. One more time. Why do we move model one to model two? Accommodate diversity in the industry and uh, accommodate technical innovation quicker. And the half a reason, get back to the spirit of the law. Why do we move from model two to model three? Because we've got high tech complex engineering settings and they genuinely do know a lot of risks and government probably can't afford to. He's got up and he's walking about. <laughs> Is it nearly time? Nearly time, right? So we um, uh, so we move to this one. Why do we move from model three to model four? Because we've got SMEs um, who band together for the sake of efficiency. All I am doing is saying, hold on, we should be prepared to move back, and that's not politically fashionable. We should recognize risks that they can't spot. We should be watching. That means going back to model 201. We ought to be able to recognize genuine externalities when they become more profitable by not controlling them and then rely on a compliance structure. These are not old hat. They're just different. And we should be master of all of the structures, uh, just like craftsmanship is master of all of your tools. Now, with this strange setup, and I hope this analysis is kind of revealing for you in some way or another. What might it mean to be risk-based? Well, it's a hokey question, but look for the word risk. It appears once up here. That's in the setting of the thing. That doesn't really count. The other place it appears is in my question. 
and that's the European question. So the more general question is, which model would work well for which risks? You know, that is not the word that most people put in that sentence. Most people say, which model works well for which industries? Like the building industry, or the farming industry, or the nuclear industry. Not fine enough. Nowhere near fine enough as a question. And your Australian scholars have already taught you that. The Rignet crowd, they talk about the ladder of trust and different corporations can be more or less capable. They should be more or less trusted. And depending on how they behave this week, we can slide them up or down the ladder of trust and treat them differently. So they have changed the word industry for the word corporation. Which models work well for which corporations? In my view, not fine enough. Because the same corporation on different risks has quite different interests and capabilities. And, you know, I use this to talk about civil aviation, which is an important risk. You know, the civil aviation industry is mostly with us on safety. Thank heavens they have a crew on board. <laughs> I hate the idea of them not having a crew when, you know, another crash happens and they issue a software update. I want them to be at risk like I am at risk. Um, and by the way, a plane crash is not just a human tragedy, it's a business catastrophe, usually. So, um, same, same airline though, on issues of consumer protection. Would you trust the self-regulatory model when it comes to anti-competitive ticket pricing? Exploitation of monopoly routes. Not giving you enough leg room so you get deep vein thrombosis in exchange for them fitting more profit centers into the plane. Failing to change your indoor filters so you're more likely to pick up infections. Keeping you captive inside the plane for three hours when you already missed the meeting that you wanted to go to and they won't let you off. All of that kind of stuff. The more of all, and lousy food. The more of that they can get away with, the more profitable they become. Same airline. So they're with you, private and public interests aligned on safety, thank heavens. They're absolutely against you on consumer protections. Banks are with us mostly on prudential issues and ensuring their own solvency. They are against us on most market conduct and consumer protection issues. Same company. So what kind of uh, a relationship do you end up having with them? Answer a complicated and nuanced one like you have with your children. Same parents, same child. On one issue, you're natural allies. There's no tension. You sit down, you talk through the issue, you're both on the same side, you cuddle up, it builds your relationship. Same parents, same child, different issue. I'm sorry, my dear, you're not old enough to have an opinion that counts. <laughs> Here are the rules and the only issue is compliance and it's necessary discipline. And boy, you hope you've got more of these issues than you have of those issues. Um, so that your relationship can survive. Complicated, nuanced, but risk by risk by risk. Simple analysis, who is best placed to see it, to control it, to motivate it, to control it, and so on. I hope that you'll be master of all of your structures as well as master of all of your tools. We have therefore not covered number six because you had so many questions earlier and it was a lot more interesting. So thank you very much. Uh, look forward to seeing some of you tomorrow. And for those um, who I won't see tomorrow, uh, I want you to know I appreciate you as regulators uh, and the complexity of the lives that you lead. Thank you very much. <laughs>